Josephine Sellers and welcome back to the Awakening TV channel. It's my great pleasure today to be able to introduce to you Mike Delaney. Mike's a specialist addictions therapist and he incorporates equine assisted psychotherapy into his practice. So welcome Mike, thanks for driving down to see us today and uh, pleasure to can't speak. wait to talk to you. And so I'm going to ask for the benefit of those watching, give us a bit about your background, how you came to work in addictions and what your career has been like. At age 16 I was brought up in central Scotland in a very kind of Catholic family. Um, at 16 I was due to go back to school and do some extra exams but I worked as a volunteer during the holidays in the local mental hospital. Um, and really enjoyed it, so decided this is what I wanted to do. Um, looking after people kind of did it for me at that point. A carer. A carer, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I did, I, I moved into the hospital and got a job and then I, I loved it so much. I trained, I became a qualified nurse in 1981. Um, and really enjoyed that job, but didn't realise when you're trained in nursing, it, it becomes very task orientated and you're trained to work a certain way. Mm. So you. You kind of you're almost trained to detach from yourself in order to do difficult things. Mm -hmm. So by the end of twenty years doing that, well, that's I was, quite a, a huge thing to do to yourself, isn't it? It is detached. It is. Yeah, and expected to know that it's happened. Yeah. Okay. And function at that level. Where nowadays supervision's in place and things are better, mm -hmm. but back then you had to just get on with it. And if you made a mistake, you were punished. So a lot of people kind of back then um, covered up mistakes and didn't own things that were going on, so there was an awful lot of secrecy and things. Um, so after 20 years I ended up in London, I was working as a community psychiatric nurse in London, in a city in the East End, really difficult, um, a lot of poverty, a lot of problems, and not realising as well that that was, I went to someone's door once um, mm. to do a, an assessment, and this gentleman said, oh come in, and I walked in, and as I turned round, he closed the door and he had a 12 inch carving knife in his hand mm. um, and this was the guy I was supposed to be assessing, the, the psychiatrist had asked me to go and see him and at that point I thought, what the hell am I doing, <laughs> why am I doing this um, mm. and after about an hour of talking him down and, and building some trust we managed to get him some help but um, at that point I was starting to think I don't know if this is for me anymore, I was becoming dissatisfied in my job but at the same time, over this period of time, my drinking and drug taking had escalated because I didn't know how to deal with this To stuff. cope with the sheer yeah, pressure. Yeah. Nobody teaches you that. No, yeah. no. Well, you're hugely young to go in at 16 yeah. and take that sort of pressure on you yeah. for a young man. Yeah. So it was five o'clock. I used to meet with other nurses and social workers yeah. in a pub. And everybody really spoke, John Wayne, speak about your day. Yeah. Um, but it got to the stage where um, the alcohol was really controlling me um, and a lot of prescription drugs and I was partying as well, I was going up the West End and doing lots of things that I should have been doing years ago but I was in a profession. Mm -hmm. So I kind of went mad for a few years. Yeah. Um, so what happened, um, to cut a long story short, I became very depressed. That was my first experience of real depression. Um, I'd had bouts of mild, what I would say was mild depression, but it was usually alcohol related. Um, I was coming off, I had a hangover or I felt ill or whatever. But this time it got really serious and for the first time in my life, I really was seriously contemplating suicide and thinking, I can't do this anymore. Um, and there was a real kind of false pride with being a nurse, thinking I should know better, I shouldn't be in this state, I should know the answer. So there was a a whole kind of conflict going on inside that um, fed the depression. It just made it worse and worse. And I was living in a little bed set in Wanstead and I just came to a decision this day and decided I'm going to do it this week, I'm going to plan it, I'm going to do it at the end of this week. And it was like a, a weight was lifted off my shoulders because I had made the decision. I had decided that was it, I was checking out. Um, and I had a few, I mean, it's quite funny on hindsight, but I had a few false alarms where I thought, I'm going to do it today. And I remember driving, uh, getting the tube up to the West End this day, and I had a rucksack with me, and I had a bottle of vodka in the rucksack, and a load of tablets that I had got for a doctor. Um, and I was going to drink it all, and then step in front of a train at Oxford Street, I remember. And I stood on the platform, 
And so when the next train comes, I'm going. And that's how depressed I was. That's horrible. That's, that's, that's really, that's really, really horrible. Yeah. But as I saw the light coming out the tunnel, something in my brain went, I'll just chop your legs off, you'll end up in a wheelchair. You know, that kind of yeah. prevented me. Yeah. <laughs> and I stepped back and went, no, I won't do that. I'll, I'll think another way. But I was getting desperate. And I remember walking through London, um, wanting somebody to look at me the wrong way so they could fight with somebody. You know, that kind of... It sounds, it sounds horrific. Desperate place. It's desperate desperate place. Sad. Yeah, It was. So when my, my nurse's logic, I thought, this ain't working. Um, so I planned it and I, and I did it to perfection. I wrote letters for all the people that were going to find me. I phoned people and said mm -hmm. I wasn't going to be around. Um, this is serious. It's, des des it's, it's absolutely crazy. It's the insanity of addiction, where I just thought the world's going to be better off. And I really believed it in my heart. The world's going to be better off without me. I'm just a waste. I'm just getting on people's nerves. I'm troublesome, you know, that kind of stuff. Comparing yourself with everyone that you see, um, People think addiction is about weakness, but I was, I've always been a really strong, resilient individual because I've came through lots of stuff in my life. So I've, I've always had that strength. So addiction is not about strength, it's about, um, it's an illness. And when you get it and, it and you cross that line, it's impossible to come back without help, really. Um, so what happened in the end, and this is where the, the spiritual side of me, if you like, comes comes back into it was, um, I did plan it. I walked miles into Epping Forest because I lived in Wanstead, so I was just next to Epping Forest. And I did the same thing with the rucksack. I got more tablets and, and I took a kitchen knife with me and I went right in and I found like a, like a little clearing. I had to break through some brambles and things to find. So I thought nobody will ever find me here, number one. Um, I had magazines and I had things to keep myself occupied while I was killing myself. It was crazy, <laughs> really crazy. Um, and I did, I sat down and I drank the drink and I took the tablets and I felt myself becoming drowsy. So I thought, I need to cut my wrist now before I fall asleep. Um, and the minute I put my hand in the rucksack, I heard branches behind me breaking and a German Shepherd dog came from nowhere and kind of vaulted over my shoulders and sat in front of me, started licking me. Oh, And I was Mike. like, what's this about, you know, what's happening? And I heard the owner shouting the dog's name and going, where are you, where are you? And it, even in my madness at that point, I went, something's happening here, something. I'm getting a clear message that this isn't meant to be. Um, it's a very moving story. Yeah. I'm just, just so moving, Mike. Yeah, well, it is. I moved. It was... Um, and I do appreciate you, you know, giving this on interview. Breaking. Thank God you didn't, because I know what you've gone on to do since. <laughs> Thank God for me, yeah, but I'll always, I need to keep that close to me so that I don't drink again. It's one of these things that I just keep it there. I don't sit and dwell on it, but I keep it nearby so that if I get a, a thought or a temptation to take a drink or a drug, I just remember how bad that, that was. Um, so the dog came? So the dog came, I actually threw the knife down, I looked at the woman and I went, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> In this Who are you? Yeah, I know, I know. Um, but having said that, I still did. I went home that night, and then on a couple of nights later, I did actually try again, and I tried to cut my wrist, and, and I did cut my wrist, and up. And that was the final straw then, because I, I seriously cut my wrist, um, and said kind of goodbye, cruel world, and woke up, and I had rolled over unconscious and stopped to bleed oh, my weight. Did you get, I'm beginning to think there's some sort of intervention honestly going on, God, Mike. Honestly, God, and at that point, I woke up in the morning and the, the worst rage I've ever felt in my life because I was still here. <laughs> um, and I was so angry. And that was the point. It took all that before I picked up the phone and said, I need some help. Because obviously I came to the conclusion I'm not going to die here. <laughs> it's so, not so easy. It's not happening. Um, <laughs> And that's, I went and I called my sister who lived nearby in London and I went and stayed with her and I got into a detox. And then, thank God, um, I managed to get some funding and I came down to a place in Western Supermere called Broadway Lodge, which was the, the greatest thing that ever happened to me in my life. I was there for five months because I was broken. It's a long time. I was a broken man. Um, How old were you then, Mike? So, 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 I was 36, 36 then. Years yeah, 20 years of. Yeah. Working and and, um, and that there was the toll you'd 
taken on you. Yeah, yeah. And I'm an anti Broadway Lodge and there was a different way of looking at things. It wasn't a medical model that I had in my head. It wasn't about um, taking tablets to stop yourself feeling a certain way. It was all about talking. So it was a huge experience for me. And that's when I saw therapy working really. Um, and I saw a staff team who were bonded together, who communicated with each other and spoke to each other. So that, I mean, I did five months there and totally changed how I felt about everything. Decided that um, I was going to stay in Western Supermare and I moved into a little um, flat, came out of treatment, moved into a little flat in Western. But I knew at that point that I wanted to work in addictions. I knew that the experience I had professionally and the, the experience I had personally could be valuable. Huge. Yeah. How can you help if you haven't been there? Mm. Yeah, it's difficult. You had it's a bit difficult. of an initiation by fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, they call it the most ex the club with the most expensive membership. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Crikey, what a story, Mike. Mm. Well, just thanks for that. So where did it go from there? So where did you start your training? Um, I started. I started working probably, I think I was maybe a year and a half sober. I decided it's time to go back into work. In the meantime, I had done some courses. I was, I was um, stayed in self-development, did lots of work, got involved in a psychic, spiritualist church. Um, was kind of looking for that thing that religion had never given me, really. Yeah, you got through the Catholic Church. Yeah, so I had never, itself. yeah, it was a very kind of punishing yeah, no. way to be brought up. And yeah. the therapy taught me that I had to be kinder to myself and, you know, and it wasn't all these some bad things that I you thought You weren't sinful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I did that and then there was a really large treatment centre near Bristol which was called Barley Wood, 67 beds. Mm -hmm. And I got a job in there. I went for a job as a nurse. Um, because you've got all that background. Yeah, so I thought I can go in as a nurse and see if I like it. Mm -hmm. um, and I went in and it was just like all my training just kicked right back in. And within three months, I was the head nurse, running the nursing team. But then they, they kind of seconded me to do my counselling training. Um, and I, was, I became a nurse therapist. So I was working across the two disciplines, which was difficult at times because I was doing the medical stuff yeah, and doing and then group therapy yeah, and stuff. But, but it was a really, that was another initiation by fire because it was a lot of clients who were criminal justice that came through the prison system. Yeah. Um, and I learned a lot about, again, about addictions because lots of them have committed really serious crimes, lots of women who had been sex workers and all that kind of yeah. stuff. But when it came down to it in group therapy, they were just damaged individuals, you know what I mean? The same as me, the same story. Everybody's got the same story with different um, surroundings. So I, I really loved my few years working there. Um, and then I was asked to go to Jersey. And I went to Jersey to set up their first rehab, which was called Silkworth Lodge, is still there, 10 years later. Um, had a year in Jersey, came back, um, spent a year, went back at the NHS for a year, I thought, let's see what the it's NHS is like. Yeah, so yeah. I got out of there pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't how it used to be, yeah, put it that way. But I ran the detox service in the West Midlands in yeah. Birmingham. Um, and then again, because I really trust now, I really, I work a programme, a 12-step programme. Yes. So I really believe that there's a power greater than me that guides me and takes care of me. And I remember, I loved Birmingham itself, I loved the city, I had fantastic friends. And I was sitting in work this day and I just flipped open my magazine, an addiction magazine, and it said, um, registered manager required. And I just shut it and I threw it across the room because I knew I was going to get that job. I just knew, but you I just knew it. I just knew it, um, but I didn't want to leave Birmingham, so I was fighting. Okay. Fighting. So you got big intuition running through, haven't you? Yeah. 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 So I, um, I was a few days later. I thought, go past that magazine, and I picked it up and I and I, and I dialed the number, and said, I don't know why I'm dialing this number. I don't want to move, but I saw your ad for it. And I was invited for an interview, and a, a bit a month later, yeah. I moved to Gloucestershire. So. Um,